<laughs> Here we are again. Here we are again. Here, enjoy, enjoy, Here you are again. <laughs> So the first thing I'd like to ask you is that you talked about us being in Christ. Mm. You also talked about that we can't lose our salvation and the fact that it's not ours. What did, what did you mean by that? Can you unpack that a little bit? Well, uh, obviously Paul's been saying God chose, God chose, God chose. And so what's really important about this is when we're talking about that idea, yeah. um, it's not in a vacuum. It's not some systematic theology chapter. Paul is addressing a problem in Corinth, yeah. which we have, which is people saying, I'm so smart that I intellectually reason myself to the existence of God and Christianity. Yeah. Okay. Now, as a guy who wrote a book trying to rationally get people to believe in God, it's a very fascinating critique yeah. a little bit on pure reason, of course. That's yeah. what the language you've been using borrowed that. Um, because... Of course, there is a sense in which we have to rationally engage with the concept of God, and that's why, you know, books like mine and other people's are important. It's still good. It's yeah. not like we go, okay. It's just that ultimately, when you pull the veil back and you've come to know Jesus, you realize that it was God's work in your life, um, and he was moving and shaping and doing things. He was hunting you down, he was, he, you know, even the picture of Jesus coming down versus us going up the mountain, God comes down to us, all of that, it's, it's, so Paul's point is it's God's work in the end. So be, and then there's all these implications, be humble, don't think that it was because you were noble and, you know, smart and, yeah. you know, these great people, because that's what starts to happen. So think about that. If that's the reality, then we can't judge anybody. Right. We can't, uh, well, I mean, you get, of course, Paul's going to say in, in First Corinthians five that we can judge the church. Yeah, which is fascinating. We can't judge the world though. Yeah, and they're because they're a lot. They don't know anything, yeah. right? So it's like we, we can't. Oh, I I I chose so much. I'm so good that God. You know, uh, I connect with God because I'm so smart and I'm of noble birth. I'm such a great person. Ergo, I can judge you if you don't know God or if you do, you know whatever. And he's trying to level all that. Yeah, and say you know the classic the the famous phrase the. The, 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 the ground at the foot of the cross is level or whatever, you know. Yeah. It's this idea that you don't have this, it's like, so that's the practical implication of what he's trying to do. Okay, and if I was to just touch on that a little bit yeah. more, as far as like facing circumstances in our own lives, yeah. what kind of freedom or assurance do they give us knowing that this is not something we've done, but something he's done for us? Well, as you alluded to, like you can't, so if it's true that you kind of can't, you know, fumble out of it. Yeah. If you have it, and of course that's the debate, yeah. right? Is is well, you can lose it, and then so does it, no, you can you can never lose it, and you know I think the question is if you have like if you if there's a concept you know Ephesians two says you were dead in your trespasses and your sins, yeah, um, you know enslaved to the to the world and the devil and the flesh, but God made you alive, seated you know raised you up and seated you in the heavens with yeah. Christ. That's, you know, God did this, God did this. If that, if you are seated, if you are like uh, categorically dead and then categorically raised up, yeah. made alive, raised up, and then seated in the heavenlies, it's not like you're seated in the heavenlies and then, you know, you, you, you cheat on your taxes. They, okay, pull you down from the heavenlies, now you're seated in the, you know. Yeah. So that's not, it's like there's a, there's a category yeah. where you've actually, you've shifted to in Christ, and if that's a reality, there's going to be levels at which you're being sanctified. There's going to be levels. Yeah. But I don't think it's an issue of the father, you know, oh, shoot, I lost a sheep. Now he's, I don't know where he is. <laughs> um, and so there's a security that comes in that. Yeah. If, if that was your reality. And so people go, well, you look me, you know, and I'm, and I'm saying, I think there's people, you know, according to Matthew 7, according to lots of there's there's counterfeit conversions. Right. There's people who just weren't really ever actually Christians. Right. Um, and so, and of course there's debate with people fly these verses around. You can debate this all day. But the point is, I'm trying to emphasize um, what Paul's point is in yeah. 1 Corinthians 1. Not to get in a debate about whether you can lose yourself yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's Bible college stuff. How many <laughs> angels can dance on the pen of an eagle? Forget that. Don't yeah. debate that in your community groups. That'll just get you real. What you need to get down to is Paul's big point yeah. in 1 Corinthians 1, which is the kind of humility that comes and the kind of security that if God has you, the question of your life shouldn't be, 
you know, oh shoot, one minute I'm saved, one minute I'm not. It's like, how do I actually grow in my sanctification, you know, in Christ? How do I actually live out so that when life falls apart, yeah. um, so that when I've done something so wrong that everyone has left me, like let's say, you know, the, I mean, the ultimate thing, you've cheated on your spouse or something, and everyone's left you. Everyone, your, your kids are mad at you, your, your work might look at you, your, your family is, you know, this and if all of that has happened and you're in Christ, Jesus doesn't leave you. Yeah. That's what it does. Yeah. The other side, everyone leaves you. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so that's the kind of security it gives you when the world falls apart. Okay. So let's, um, let's discuss that as a group. Let's think about how we are in Christ. Let's think about how secure we are. Um, and... Mark mentioned about Ephesians 2. Uh, maybe we could, we could read that as a group and, and gather that. Let's discuss that as a group. And also think about how we can live through our life circumstances with that, just that enormous security that knowing yeah. that God and Jesus is with us. So the next thing I'd like to touch on, Mark, is this whole idea that, you know, that Paul made this phenomenal effort yeah. to actually plant the Corinthian church. Yeah, I, I came mean, to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's just it's absolutely amazing yeah. that he did that. You know, the, the purpose that God gave him, how he was led by the Spirit, that he did that. What's the catch for us in the, kind of, in the suburbs as far as just being consumers? And, and how does that kind of make the church captive? You mentioned this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the captivity is that we... Okay, so... I was, uh, yesterday I had lunch with this, uh, this Korean guy, yeah. a Korean American, and we were chatting through the differences about the cultures, okay, white culture, and he said, hey, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't mean to be, he's like, I don't mean to be, you know, critical, he's like, but white people, I'm like, oh yeah, I want to hear this, <laughs> I lean in, I'm like, I want to, and he was talking about, um, he said, you know, because we're talking about how do you plant churches that reach different ethnicities yeah. and blah, blah, so, he said, you know, one of the things about, you know, white culture, or Western culture, is you guys show up to church on Sunday oftentimes and then you you disband and it's like, leave me alone and yeah. I'll see you again on Sunday. Or, yeah. Well, I mean, you guys don't because you're in a community group, but oftentimes people do that. And there's this kind of consumeristic, like, let me go, let me get my 70 minutes. If it goes 75, I'm looking at my watch yeah. or whatever. And then, whatever. And so, and then come back next week and isn't it? But he said, uh, Asian culture is not like that. Right. They, they want, so he's like, you know, if I planted a church, it would be constant community, wow. constant, let's do barbecue on Wednesday night, let's do Bible study Thursday night, let's yeah. do, because there's this real communal aspect to everything they do. Okay. Um, and I think that's, that's what the, the suburban captivity is. It's this, it's this I, I, I parachute in, I parachute out yeah. of Christian life, right. of the ecclesia, the church, yeah. the people of God. I come in and I come out because because so what is that? It's it's the suburban captivity of individualism and privatization, for okay. instance, you know. So, so there's all kinds of things we could go through. Yeah. My money's mine. Right. That's another thing that he said. That's not really the way. I mean it, there's a sense so there's a there's an ability to go um, you know when you start comparing cultures. Yeah. You know uh, he talked about how Asian culture, like if they're part of something, they're like, they're in, they support it. They're yeah, like, yeah. I don't just come in and consume, I they jump you know, in, give to it, and yeah. I'm part of it, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's this sense of let's challenge that suburban captivity of the Western mind in yeah. regard to the way they do church, where it's just this, this cerebral thing or this experiential thing that has no communal reality to it. And um, or it's a safe place, or my, it's privatization. None of the you read Acts too. <laughs> yeah. None of the, like yeah. what are they doing? That's where we get the word community. Is everything they had in common? Yes. All their money was pooled. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not talking. You know, I'm not Karl Marx. I'm not saying that we should be Marxist. I'm not saying we should be socialist. Uh, I'm just saying that there is there's this really radical communal reality. So, for instance, uh, I've been part of community groups where if someone in the group can't pay the rent it's like pass the hat around wow. and let's make sure we this guy can pay the rent yeah so hopefully you have those moments and I know you guys do in your groups where you you show up when the person needs you to show up and you're there for them and you lean in it might be financial it might be a presence you know it might whatever it is um, anyway I, I think all of those things 
are how we push against the suburban captivity of the church. Just the uselessness of individualization, privatization, everything's my own. I dip in and I dip out. I don't do anything that um, makes me uncomfortable. Everything's on my own terms. Right. That's the suburbs, okay. right? That's my grass. You know, it's my little world here I've built, my little Eden. Yeah. And you can get off my grass. Yeah. You know, my dad used to do that. People would run. Yeah, I, lived I, on, I, too. Yeah, I lived in a corner and my dad would, you know, yeah. get off my grass. And he'd throw his, you know, shoe at people. And that's the suburbs, man. It's you know, man. where in the urban world, it's like, yeah. you don't have, you have your apartment or something. Or you have your little, you know, but, and so I think there's a, it's definitely a more, anyway, so it's an interesting, so that's, that's the critique. Okay. That the church has become a reflection of the suburbs versus urban context in that isolated, kind of homogeneous, you know, sphered out categorical world. Yeah. Um, and the gospel challenges that. Of course, you know, Galatians 2, yeah. you know, uh, they're eating separately. And Peter, Peter did, he had it, and then he pulled back and he starts eating with Jews. Yeah. And Paul shows up, he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm just eating with Jews. He's like, what are all these Gentile believers? Yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, but they're second class, so I started eating with these guys. Yeah. And he's like, you can't, don't separate. Yeah. Like, it's all one big, you know, thing. And the minute you start eating only here with the Jews and leave the Gentiles over here at a different table, you've misunderstood the gospel. It's not that right. you've, it's not that your, 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 your life and behavior is wrong. It's that your theology, you haven't actually understood the gospel. Yeah. So you're a disaster. You know, that's Paul getting all jacked up. So we need gospel theology. theology. We need gospel theology that goes, my gosh, I wonder what a melding looks like. I wonder what a communal, anyway, that's two or three things. But of course we can go through a list of how the church has become captive to suburban ideals. Yeah. And how we need to push against those. Um, okay. If, when we understand the gospel and understand, coming back to your point, yeah. the, the going. If you've created Eden, then it's going to be really hard to go. Yeah. And Paul said, I came to you. I left the comfort of Tarsus where I grew up and wherever he was living at the yeah. time. I left all that. I went away for a couple of years. I learned how Jesus was God. And actually, you know, there's this great image of he actually doesn't necessarily rethink Jesus. He rethinks God yeah. in light of Jesus and realized that Jesus is in the very center of who God is. Yeah. And that's, you know, Philippians 2, where he redefines, he puts the cross in the center of his version of God, Colossians 1. Um, and he says, I've gone away and rethought that, and now I've come back, uh, you know, and, and I've come to you. And he goes on all these missions. It's crazy, all the that's churches he planted. Yeah. And then he ends up in Rome because he wants to go to Spain. And no one ever knows if he ever got to Spain or not. Right. But he ends up, you know, at the end of the book of Acts, he's under house arrest in Rome. Yeah. Um, but he goes. And he leaves everybody he knows and everything he knows and the comfort of this little get off my grass thing. And he yeah. goes, and I'm not saying that's everyone's life, but that we have to sell our homes and leave. You know, I think there's a Jeremiah 29, buy a home, root yourself yeah. in the city and, and, and fight for the good of the city that you're part of in Babylon in exile. Yeah. So that's, that's what we need to do too. I'm not telling everyone to sell their homes yeah. and get out here. What I'm saying is there needs to be a spirit of I went, I left what was comfortable for me and I went into your life because you didn't know Jesus, and I actually did everything I could so that you, I didn't expect you to come to me on, on my terms, Yeah. which is why I talked about John 4 and John 8. Yeah. Jesus hung out with people who would have made a suburban life feel uncomfortable at yeah, times. Scary. So when I look at my kids, I'm at a 12 year old, 10 year old, like, like, what if I brought a prostitute into my house yeah. and had dinner with her, you know, with my family home? Like, like how, what would, oh, I've got to protect my kids from the, you know, dishevelment of not a perfect put together life or whatever, you know? It's like, what if I invited people in my home more and more and more or just had, just did life alongside of people who weren't perfect, who didn't talk like me, vote like me, think like me, dress like me. That's what Jesus did and that's our calling ultimately. It's funny so you're saying, it's funny you're saying yeah. that because I'm my dad's church. Um, they spent a lot of time with people like that. One day I was sitting there one Sunday there's a guy next to me on one side who'd just done time uh, for murder, yeah. come out after 20 years. And on yeah. the other side, there's a guy who dealt with cocaine and come out after 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is the gospel. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And we actually, you know, we actually have 
all kinds of those people at Village. Yeah. I hear their stories. There's people who come out of prison. We, there's, there's a guy, actually, an amazing guy, runs a prison ministry, and they show the sermons in the prison. Oh, um, yeah. And there's guys who come to know Christ, and I've met them in the foyer multiple times wow. where it's they've come to know Jesus in prison, and then they come out and they make Village their own. There might be people in that situation in your community. Yeah. There might, you know, people, people are not as you know perfect as they may seem at times, and yeah. Village is full of real people, broken people yeah. who... You know who God's grace is. I, I spoke at Wagner Hills this past week and got to get in the lives of all these guys who are trying to put their life back together. They're addicts, and uh, they're sitting there going, just holding on to Jesus, man. And, and you know what's beautiful about that, to be honest, guys, is you have no more captive audience. Like I stood in a kitchen and there was forty guys. Yeah. And most most contexts where I go and there's forty guys in a room. Guys are shoveling around, looking at their phones. Yeah. I mean, they're so busy. You're so excited. You're so great. Yeah. You know, no point listening to this guy rant on right. it for an hour. These guys, you could have heard a pin drop wow. for the full hour. Yeah. No phones, no focused. Yeah. Because they know what know what it means to need the grace of God. And Jesus told a parable. And I actually shared that. And Jesus wow. told a parable like that. And he said there's people who got forgiven of a lot of stuff. Yes. And then there's a guy who got forgiven of little, who do you think is gonna know okay. God more? Yeah. You know, and it's like <laughs> this great image of man, but that's all of us, of course. So anyway, that was a lot of different angles. Oh, I love so, it, I uh, love it. Okay, so let's, let's just think about that as a, a group. Think about gospel theology. Think about how God um, wants us to break out of our kind of suburban mold, and that he's, he's given us his Holy Spirit to do that. We're not on our own, um, and he's challenging us. So let's discuss that as a group. There's a couple of scriptures that Mark you know, talked about. We talked about John 4 and John 8. Maybe we could look at those as well as, as a part of our discussion. Mark, we're heading more towards, we've gone from the back end of Corinthians 1, and now we're in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. Right. And this whole idea that, that Paul hasn't come with like magnificent words. Right. He's not speaking like Churchill or whoever. Right. Or a president, he, he says, "I came with fear and trembling." Yeah. Okay, but with evidence or demonstration of the Spirit's power. Yeah. So that we wouldn't rely on that. Okay. Could you unpack that a bit for us, um, as far as that happening to him? Yeah. Well, that happens to us. I, th I think for, I think what's very interesting is when we think about Christianity, depending on the uh, maybe the tradition we grew up in. Yeah. We tend to think of it in one of those two extremes that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Either it's all rational, logical, yeah. you know, theology or doctrine, or it's all experiences and no theology. It's just like, give me another experience, give me another experience. You know, yeah. there's very little doctrinal depth, you know, in those sometimes in those movements. And so you have both of these worlds, and Paul's kind of saying, look, neither of them actually by themselves are any good. Yeah. Uh, you need good theology to inform your experiences or what are your experiences yeah. they're just like you know whatever yeah but you need you need the spirit to empower you to be able to kill sin live a life of joy and mission you know uh martin lloyd jones yeah who we both love uh how did he define preaching right yeah. logic on fire yeah that's that's what life should be. Yeah. That's what that's what it is. It, that's what Christianity. That's a great image of Christianity. It should be logical. It should yeah. be rational. It should be not you know wacky. Like I talked about in the sermon. Like you talk to someone, they're like, "I saw a UFO," and you're like, "I would totally believe it if it wasn't you." Yeah. Because <laughs> everything about your life is yeah. you know you're always of course it's that. I never I never bump into you yeah, yeah. and you're like. Oh, I saw a UFO. I'm like, David saw a UFO. That must be real. But the yeah. guy who always sees a UFO is always like wacky enough where I'm like, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, uh, so you need logic, but then you need that logic to be on fire and uh, you need it to actually produce. So every time the spirit falls um, in the book of Acts, or whatever, there's this great missional thing it does. It's like when Jesus talks about the spirit, it's not just for your private life. Yeah. It's for mission. Constantly. Yeah. The Spirit's going to come. He's going to do this. He's going to say, Acts 2, it falls, boom, they go on mission, and yeah. away we go. So I think we all need to be asking the Holy Spirit to come into our life, to fill us constantly. There is a filling that takes place yeah. um, so that we're walking in the, in, the, in the fullness of the Spirit. There's a great book by uh, Charles Stanley called The Spirit-Filled Life. Okay. Um, you know, that's the kind of resource that you can go. You know, so, any, so I, I think Paul... Doesn't want us just going, okay, I've got, I've got the Father figured out, I've got Jesus figured out, and then there's like, 
you know, what Francis Chan called the forgotten God, right? It's, oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So there you go. So, so it's kind of like this, yeah, the Spirit like does something every once in a while. It's like, no, there's actually the Holy Spirit's this, like, this presence with us now. Yeah. Um, because the physical person of Jesus ascended to heaven. And he yes. said, so I'm, I'm, this, I'm this, like, localized person. Yeah. And I, that localized person has gone, you know, to, to heaven. Now I'm going to send a spirit that can be in, you know, you and me and yeah. a billion people at once. And that's the person that I need you to, you know, relate to and be, in, be the one who's going to give you the power for your life. So anyway, so that's why I think Paul's like, look, what will happen is there'll be demonstrations of the power of this person in your, if you're living in it. There's going to be things that actually happen. Supernatural things. Supernatural things. Yeah. There's going to be healings. There's going to be prayers answered. Yeah. There's, he's going to convict you and speak to you in coffee shops and grocery stores and yeah. with your kids. And, you know, there's going to be moments where there's, where there's real things. Yeah. And you got to, you got to recognize that those things are demonstrations that, that the gospel is actually real. That's his whole point. Right. And so the world, and it's fascinating. My buddy, um, Kerry Newhoff just wrote an article on this. We were, he was one of the guys down in San Diego we were talking. And he just wrote an article about how, how the charismatic movement, I mean, they tend to be the growing churches in the Western world. And his deduction of that, and I think there's, you know, all kinds of sociological uh, things that are fascinating about why that is. But one of the things is, is we live in a culture that desires experiences. Yeah. We don't just want dry data. Yeah. We want experience stuff. And, um, and of course that has its pitfalls yeah. uh, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks because you become, you become dependent on these experiences. Of course, Jesus warned against that. You want a sign, I'm not going to give you one. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> you want all these things to happen all the time. I'm not going to give you that. Uh, because you're going after the wrong, your motive's wrong. Yeah. Your motive's like, wow me. That's a hard you know, it, it, it's a hard thing, right? Yeah. The devil says, jump off this cliff and you'll fly around and everyone's going to believe. And Jesus goes, nope. Okay, turn this, you know, do these miracles, yeah. and then everyone's going to believe me. He's yeah. like, nope, denies them all. Yeah. Because he doesn't want people to believe in the kingdom based on miracles because that's going to become derailed over time because yeah. ultimately we all die. Yeah. Ultimately, at some point, David, I'm going to pray for your yeah, sickness, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and the answer is going to be no. <laughs> You're dead. You know. So, uh, so don't become so dependent on that that that's what you need every time. But Paul's saying, but there will be really pragmatic, tangible demonstrations that the gospel is true yes um through the power and the working of the spirit and so you got to pay attention to those because these are great and i think the world coming back to carrie's point the world looks in and says i, I don't just want to i want to actually experience god yeah and i think we in the you know i, I uh, give a talk on this um we all talk about in the post-christian world how how are people actually going to believe in jesus and how I think one of the things that we're, we're going to see in the Western world in the next 20 years is uh, those kinds of experiential realities yeah. are going to be reasons that people believe yeah. and come to know Christ and actually experience Jesus in profound, crazy ways. Yeah. And of course, you hear stories from all over the world about these kind of things, and they're real and they're true. Oh, yeah. We believe they're still a thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh, you hear about Muslims in prison and Jesus shows up dream. Yeah, like well. in a dream, and it's like a, because in Islam, they the dreams are a thing. Yeah. Dreams are part of their theology. Yeah. As are angels. Yeah. So that's why there's like all this stuff that happens with angels and dreams and because it's actually a bigger part of their theological, you know, yeah. framework. Yeah. So Jesus enters in yeah. to what they already prioritize yeah. and uses it to speak to them. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so anyway. so um, I think there's a translation to that in the Western world. I think we gotta So tell me one story uh, about a demonstration of the Spirit's power in your own life. I didn't tell you. You, I was going to ask. That's <laughs> on the spot, but give me something off the top here. Well, we, well, I mean, just in practical issues, uh, it can be very, very practical. It's very pragmatic. Yeah. We were praying about moving to BC. Yeah. And we thought, Lord, this is going to be a hard. From thing. Australia. No. <laughs> <laughs> From Ontario. Oh, From okay, Burlington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Burlington. Right, right. And we said, Lord, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta do this. We can't orchestrate it all. Someone, yeah. someone is offering me work. Da, da, da. It's just like messy. Yeah. So they said, Lord, give us a sign. Make it clear. Demonstrate your spirit. We, yeah. we should move. So we sold our house in one day. Mm. Wow. Which is pretty miraculous. Yeah. Just That's amazing. And then um, we started connecting with people. And that, that was a kind of phenomenal, 
phenomenal thing. They said, and the spirits, I mean, led us umpteen times just to. We've had guys. You mentioned guys that you come in contact. We've had guys living with us uh, and uh, got saved for about 15, 20 years over the yeah. years. And uh, God led us to those people, mm -hmm. and it was like either through a friend or we met some or such and such, and they just needed help. Right. And so it, I think. It's just being open to God. Right. And it, you know, there's kind of umpteen situations where God has just like steered us and we connect with somebody. Yeah. So I think that for me, for people in the community groups, right. it's just it's literally just being open to God in practical things, mm -hmm. but also seeking God about supernatural stuff, but not in a wacky way, right. but in a way that extends the kingdom. Yeah. Okay. And, and Paul's going to get into trying to pull the reins back on the wackiness yeah. you know, in later chapters because right. Corinthians was a wacky. Okay. Got into the way. Yes, I think, I think, yeah. yeah, it's great. So let's, let's, let's just uh, discuss that as a group. You know, we, we live not just on planet Earth, but we actually live in an amazing kingdom. Yeah. It is a supernatural kingdom, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's Jesus' kingdom. And we've got to be open to the way he guides us. So let's just think about how what Paul was talking about, the demonstration of the Spirit's power yeah. in our lives. And also uh, touch on some of the issues that Mark talked about. This, this is pra pragmatic, but it goes beyond that. It is supernatural. So it's about expectation. Are we expecting uh, God to use us? And our answer to that is, yes, he will. Mm -hmm. So I want to encourage you in that, and we yeah. can discuss that as a group. We've been looking how, how Paul is um, coming as a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He's going into Corinth. And just thinking about that and these kind of missional intents, let's think about the missions that are going on at the moment in Village. Uh, you know, we've recently come back from Greece, there's, there's trips to Greece, and now there's a trip to Nepal. Let's pray about that and global missions, and we'll see you next week.